Hello and welcome to Anatomy and Physiology Journal Club number 7. Today I'd like to cover a recent publication that links autism spectrum disorder with certain types of learning. Along the way I'd like to focus on some things that I cover in my Anatomy and Physiology courses at Mount Hood Community College. The current publication looked at one of the risk factors for developing autism and recreated it genetically in a mouse. And what they found was that the male mice, but not the female mice, that have the same mutation that, in humans, increases the risk for being on the autism spectrum, leads to changes in specific types of learning in the male mice, and are correlated with behaviors in these mice that are similar to what we see in humans. This is what's known as using a mouse model. A number of studies have identified risk factors in humans that are associated with the autism spectrum. These fall into two broad categories, both nature and nurture. For instance, on the nurture side, deficiencies in L-carnitine during pregnancy are associated with an increased risk for autism. On the nature side, a number of genes have been identified. We'll be talking about three major ones, the norexin and norregulins, shank proteins, and the one today is the ERK enzyme. These mutations have been associated with the development of autism in humans, but what has been done today is to recreate one of these mutations in a mouse and see if that is enough to cause autism-like behaviors. Let's start with memory. Short-term memory involves electrical activity in the prefrontal cortex. If these action potentials here stop firing, the memory will be lost. To convert this into a more long-term memory requires activity of the hippocampus. These brain regions can consolidate short-term memories into long-term memories that are stored elsewhere in the cortex. To help the hippocampus decide which short-term memories are worth storing, and which aren't, the emotional centers of the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala can help. The nucleus accumbens is activated when we experience pleasurable emotions, while the amygdala is typically activated when we experience negative emotions. Storing a memory involves strengthening the connections between neurons. Let's zoom in on this synapse here. It's likely that these synapses are already formed, but are not very strong. The first, or presynaptic neuron, when it fires an action potential, will release a little bit of neurotransmitter onto the postsynaptic cell, which can receive that signal on its dendrites. Initially, this connection may not be very strong, and this may not trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic cell. Changes to the synapse, though, can increase the connection strength between these two cells. Initially, activation of second messenger systems may lead to the phosphorylation of receptors on the postsynaptic cell, making them more efficient. Next, the postsynaptic cell may increase the number of neurotransmitter receptors that it has on its plasma membrane, and the presynaptic cell can make more neurotransmitter-filled vesicles. Hence, when the presynaptic cell fires an action potential, it will now be releasing more neurotransmitter onto the postsynaptic cell, which has more receptors, and these receptors may be activated more easily because they've been phosphorylated. These are changes in protein expression and enzyme activity, and are not long-term. This sort of memory may last for weeks. To make this memory more permanent, we must have structural changes. The presynaptic cell can make more axon terminals, and the postsynaptic cell more dendritic spines, increasing the number of synapses between these two cells. And this leads us to the link with autism. It turns out that the formation of more synapses involves proteins that have been linked to autism. Genetic analysis of people on the autism spectrum compared with neurotypical people has resulted in a number of proteins identified that can increase the risk of developing autism. Many of these proteins are involved in the formation of new synapses.
The first are a pair of proteins called the neuregulins and neurexins. These are plasma membrane proteins that stick to one another. When the presynaptic cell makes new axon terminals, the postsynaptic cell must find them. It sends out philopodia, and when the neuregulin on the postsynaptic cell sticks to the neurexin on the presynaptic cell, these two cells form a new synapse. Changes in the function of these two proteins can decrease the ability of neurons to increase their synaptic strength. Hence, this can lead to deficits in certain types of learning that people on the autism spectrum experience. Next up, we simply have a connection between two cells. We have to get neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter receptors close to one another. This leads to the function of the next protein that is often mutated in people on the autism spectrum. And that's a protein called shank. It helps to tag the norexin and neuregulin combination and bring in neurotransmitter receptors to this new dendritic spine. Defects in the function of shank also diminish the formation of new synapses and lead to changes in learning in people on the autism spectrum. And now we get to the topic of today's paper. Once the receptors get to the dendritic spines, they must be functional. And what the researchers found is that a type of glutamate receptor, a G-protein coupled receptor known as a metabotropic glutamate receptor, is capable of activating a second messenger pathway that leads to the activation of an enzyme called ERK, or MAP kinase. And it turns out that mutations in this enzyme are also linked to autism spectrum disorder. In fact, what the researchers found is that if you mutate one of two copies of this ERK enzyme in male mice, it leads to half of the amount of the ERK protein being made. And this is correlated with autism-like behaviors. On the other hand, in female mice with the same mutation, they increase the transcription from the one copy that they have. And this does not lead to autistic-like behaviors. The previous genetic analysis had identified a large number of genes that, when mutated, increased the risk of being on the autism spectrum. This publication, and a few other recent ones, helps to consolidate a number of these into a single story. Nevertheless, autism is a complicated disorder, hence we use the expression spectrum. One person on the spectrum is not the same as another. There is no single cause for autism. Still, many of what previously seemed like disparate causes are now linked to a single pathway. So where were these changes seen? It turns out that the hippocampus is just fine, but we can see deficits in the nucleus accumbens, which leads to changes in the way that these mice learn. They have deficits in reward-based learning. And we can hypothesize that in humans, the pleasurable sensations that accompany having a positive interaction with another human might be diminished in people on the autism spectrum. Because there are no changes seen to the hippocampus, other forms of learning are not diminished, and in fact might even be enhanced to compensate. Now this is just one area of interest. The cerebellum has also been implicated in the development of autism spectrum disorder, but that's going to be a topic for another day. If you wish to read the primary literature, it is open source and accessible to the public. I did skip over a few key points that you might be interested in. For instance, even though the male mice have half of the amount of the ERK protein, ERK protein activity is elevated both a signal that cannot be turned on or a signal that's turned on all the time would not be very useful. Secondly, I mentioned the nucleus accumbens and in the publication they talk about the striatum which includes the nucleus accumbens. I simplified to match what I teach in my class. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed watching and I hope to do another one of these soon.